Thursday evening, December the 28th, 1978. Midwinter camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Wynn Worley is the speaker of the evening. But uh, we're going to talk tonight about vows and curses a little bit. And let me say at the outset, I'm going to just be very, uh, it's going to be more or less a synopsis. I'm just going to give you some teasers to get you started. Uh, at our church, I figure if I can give a message that will get my people into the Word of God, this is the uh, best, best way to feed them. I don't want to get them all satiated so that they have so much spiritual food they say, well, I can put my Bible on the shelf and preacher fed me for a week. Uh, not that I would be likely to do that, but I mean, some people might get that idea. It's much better to give you enough to get your brain wheels working, get the rust off of them, so that you can begin to think and use the gray matter. Did you know that God uh, didn't put our brains in our heads to go on vacation when we get saved or filled with the Spirit or delivered? He plans to use all the experiences and everything else that we have. Even the bad experiences will be turned against Satan and will be used to help others get free if we'll yield ourselves to the Lord. Even our worst mistakes can be turned for the benefit of us and others if we will be willing to learn from those things, if we'll quit being stubborn and rebellious and and self-righteous about it and just admit, boy, I blew it. And... uh, We've got to get away from the legalism of past days that bound people and forced them to do things. Now, that doesn't mean the preachers are supposed to uh, tiptoe around like they're walking on marshmallows. I appreciated Brother Frank and and the other men who have been speaking here uh, to speak forthrightly. We need to put it out just like we see it. And don't you get mad at anybody who puts it out like they see it. If you don't see it that way, go pray about it. Don't go to arguing. Go pray. Go get in the Word and find out if these things be so. If they're so, do it. If they're not, argue with God. If they're, if they're not so, you're not under any obligation. And I might say this too. You know, deliverance is not a cure-all. When people first stumble into deliverance, they think, oh boy, now i found the easy way, the shortcut to spirituality. Now I can be super Christian number one with very little effort. Somebody else will do most of the work for me. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people will take out on that trail. And we discourage that heartily because although deliverance is an integral part of the gospel in the Great Commission, it will not do everything. For instance, deliverance doesn't substitute for anything. It's not a substitute for repentance. It's not a substitute for the new birth. It's not a substitute for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not a substitute for faithfulness to the Lord. It's not a substitute for clean living. It's not a substitute for Bible study. It's not a substitute for prayer. It's not a substitute for anything. But it's a part of what God wants to give you and, and me and to do through us and for us. Amen. Deliverance is a vital part. It's a, well, it took up a third of Jesus' ministry. How peculiar that one third of Jesus' ministry is almost totally overlooked in the average group of believers today. But thank God, God is bringing that into focus and into light. And although deliverance will not do everything, what it does do, nothing else will do. You can't crucify the demons. They refuse. You can crucify the old sin nature and bring it, bring it into subjection. That's the, that was the remedy for the problems in your life and my life caused by the old sin nature. And by the way, friend, I, if you don't know this, you're not going to sanctify that rascal out of existence either. You can sanctify him all you want to and he'll still be reprobate. That, that part of you and me is rotten. But he can be overcome. God has made the way. And so uh, we are crucify him by walking with the Lord, by praying, by studying the Word, by fellowshipping with other believers. Did you know that you need other believers? Did you know you're not an island unto yourself? You need the fellowship of other believers? You could even learn something from them. That's right. And we need to understand this, that God so constituted things so we would be a body. He wants us to be not separate entities walking our own way, but rather parts of the same body led of His Spirit into wonderful unity, not because we're forced to, but because... This is what we really want. And this is what we desire. And this is where we find fulfillment and joy is in working together in the body of Christ with others. And the old sin nature can be crucified, not the demons. The demons must be cast out in Jesus' name. And thank God the knowledge is spreading far and wide in these days. Now there are many... When demons do not yield, when they do not come out, there is always a reason... Let me say that again. When they don't come out, they, there is always some underlying reason. You may not know it. The deliverance worker who may be trying to help you may not know. 
but there's always some reason why they're not budging. Because the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus is infinitely superior to anything the enemy can bring up. The firepower we have at our disposal is enough to blow the enemy off the map. If we could just learn how to aim it and pull the trigger at the right time. But we, uh, we have a lot of Bible study to do. The answers are in the Word of God. Over eight years ago, when this ministry exploded in the midst of our church, uh, and turned us into that funny little church, uh, the uh, prophecies began to come by, come in repeatedly, and ever so often it's repeated again. All the answers are in my word. All the answers that you will need I have already put in my word. The students of my word. Over and over again, this is a theme that comes through. Study my word. There's no substitute for this. You don't sit around and say, okay, Lord, hit me with it. Uh, if God's put it in his word, he wants you to do some digging. You say, don't you believe in the gift of discerning of spirits? I sure do. We'd be awfully uh, bad off without them. And God uh, does give discernment, and he does supply word of knowledge and word of wisdom, and all of these things work. But he also has put great treasure troves of information in his word, and you and I are not going to get it any other way but digging. You get gold by digging it, and the gold is here. And God expects us to dig it out. He doesn't... He's not going to encourage us to be lazy, lazy. And there always are reasons when demons do not budge. People come and they say, well, you know, I've been prayed for three or four times and Derek Prince prayed for me and this one prayed for me and this one prayed for me. Nothing happened. You think I don't have any demons? I said, do you still have the problem? They said, yeah. I said, then you still have the demons. But he said, but nothing manifested. I said, all that happened is several people prayed for you and nothing happened. You know. There's nothing to get upset about. I said, you just need to keep pecking away until we find the thread. Did you ever try to rip the seam out of, an, of a sack? You know, you just have to pick every stitch. You just have to pick, 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 pick. You ladies understand this. Most of the time preachers use illustrations only men understand, huh? All right. But you ladies are all nodding your head and the men are looking like, what, what's he talking about? <laughs> Didn't you ever rip a toe sack out, fellas? All right. Uh, anyway, you have to pick, you know, and get those threads apart. And then, but if you, and you keep pulling, you know, and all of a sudden you pull it just right when you just right, and you just rip, and boy, the whole thing comes up. You know, demon fighting is kind of like that. Sometimes you just have to pick, and you have to pick for every single one. You think, oh my goodness, this is taking so long. And then all of a sudden you find a key, you find the thread. There's always a key. If you ever get older, you just go rip, and boy, they just come pouring out. And then everybody knows that there's been a massive breakthrough for the Lord. And just like the total, of my, the the title of my new book. Demolishing the host of hell. Every Christian's job. I think it's our job to tear the devil's nest apart. Amen. When I stand in my pulpit, I tell my people the order of the day is attack, attack, attack. That makes it simple. You know, it's easy to remember. Three A's, attack, attack, attack. <laughs> it never changes so everybody can memorize it. And that's the only way we're going to win in this battle is to take the offensive. The church has been on the defensive too long. She's tried to retreat into her pillboxes and her sanctuaries with her robed choirs, and they sing, ah, oh, man, and they might as well sing, ah, oh, Shaw, because there's nothing happening. There's nothing been happening. Nothing's going to happen. Did you know the devil's not upset at all about most of the massive programs to get the kingdom on the earth that you hear about? There's been tons of literature written telling about how we're going we're gonna to establish this and we're going to take that. And we're gonna... You're not going to do anything until you attack the enemy on his home ground. You're never going to shoot the, blue, the birds out of the tree by beating on the, on the roots, down to, by beating the hammer on the root of the tree. They're up there in the thing. You raise your shotgun up and blew it, you'll blow the whole thing apart. And our business is to arm the Christians with enough ammunition to blow those birds out of the tree. And I'll tell you what, the woods are full of them. You can't hardly miss when you get your gun going. <laughs> we have people come to our church, you know, and they'll say, they'll say, well, I never saw anything like this. Does this happen all the time? I said, well, yes. This is normal New Testament type thing. I said, this is what caused riots when Paul and Jesus walked on the earth. I said, at least we do it inside the building. <laughs> so far. If you hear a bunch of us in jail up in Chicago, it'll probably cause somebody... And we've got some fanatics in our church that are praying that God will give us open doors to preach on the streets. Can you imagine how that bunch of hegwish demon fighters taking to the streets, what's going to happen? I don't know. Well, whatever the Lord says. But the order of the day is attack the enemy. 
learn, study, find out what God has said. Read Frank and Ida May's book. It's essential that you know. They've got some material in there you won't find any place else. I'll even recommend my own books because they come out of the laboratory of a church that's in battle, in full-scale battle, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our people have even engaged the Illuminati in battle, as I told you. We believe that it's time to shoot. As a matter of fact, when our people became aware of the Illuminati, the first thing that happened, some of them came up to me and said, Well, since this is true, we know what to do. I said, What are you talking about? I said, Well, we know how to bind loose spirits. We're going to attack them directly. There's no use attacking them down here on the ground when the power is coming from up overhead. And you, you know it wasn't a week until we had a wild manifestation. A demon snarled at me from the floor and he said, I hate your guts, Wen Worley. I said, well, so what's new? I said, who are you? He said, I'm a prince. I said, all right. He said, well, I'm not just an ordinary one. I'm from the Illuminati. He said, who do you think you are, Wen Worley? How dare you? How dare you seek this puny little church on us? I said, if it's so puny, why are you so upset? <laughs> Friends, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal and it makes a dent. And the enemy is bluffing when he says it doesn't make any difference. He's bluffing when it says it doesn't do any good to bind spirits. I'm convinced, I can't prove this, but I'm convinced that every time you bind a spirit, it weakens it to a degree. And do it just like a spider does. Just wrap a web around it. Just keep binding, keep binding, keep binding. And at first you'll have a violent reaction because that means you're on target. And things will get worse. Cheer up. The worst is yet to come. <laughs> then you'll cheer up and sure enough, the worst will come. But then the best is when God comes through and breaks the bonds and you have something to really praise the Lord. One of the reasons that people don't become free is because of curses. Now, Brother Frank mentioned this earlier. And everything he said, I'd say amen to about curses. When we first got into this, we didn't know anything about much of anything. Uh, in the spiritual world. When you walk into deliverance, you walk into a new world. Very few people have tread those paths. And a lot of them ran off scared. And some of them backed off and said it's not worth it. But uh, once you get a taste of it, I don't see how you can quit. But we found out about, I found out about curses the hard way. One was dumped in my lap. There was a young man who was in his teens, early teens, and he had gotten tangled up with a young lady before he got saved. He'd broken this relationship, and when he came to our services, he'd been saved, and uh, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit there, and he, he got a lot of deliverance in many areas. But he was constantly troubled by lust, which is not an uncommon thing for young men. However, his was uncommonly bad, and he just seemed he couldn't shake it, and it just tormented him. And he, and he came, and I had I'd talked to the spirit of lust in him a number of times. We had battled, and we'd locked horns, and... We'd done everything we knew to get the thing out and it never succeeded. And complete. we had uh, beaten off a lot of the supporting work, demons and all this. But the main rule was still there. And this had happened two or three times. And so one time he came up and he said, Pastor Worley, he said, I, that same old thing is after me again. He said, I just can't. I pray. I read my Bible. I have done everything I know to do and nothing seems to work. Well, that made me mad. I'm a shepherd and that was one of my little lambs that thinking thing was chewing on. And I said, all right, just sit down here, son. I said, all right, let's front and center. I want to talk to you right now. He said, shut your mouth, Worley. I'm here. And I said, you're going to come out. He said, you can try all you want to, Worley. You've tried before, and I'm not coming out. No way. He said, he belongs to us. This is our house, and we're not coming out. I said, well, we'll see about that. I said, I'm going to torment you. If it takes all night long, I'm going to stay up, and I'm going to beat the daylights out of you. I said, I'm sick and tired of this boy suffering. And I said, you just might as well. I took my coat and towel, and I said, you just might as well get ready to come out, demon, because you're coming out. I'm sick of this. I said, this boy loves the Lord with all his heart, and he's surrendered himself to the Lord, and he's going to be free. No, nah, you're not going to do it. Well, I went to work on him. I can be ugly. You wouldn't think so, but I can't. Uh, <clears throat> but when I come up against the demon, I get nasty. And they gave me the nickname in the spirit world, the Tormentor. The tormentor has come. Because I found all kinds of neat little things that uh, put the screws down on the enemy. And I don't have any mercy whatsoever. I've had a lot of them holler for mercy, and I never give them any. They didn't give the person any, and I don't see any. They reap what they sow. And so uh, I came down hard on this thing. And after a while, he was beginning to get weary. And pretty soon he began to beg, No, Worley, stop. 
And, and the boy was heaving horribly, just heaving, 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 heaving. And the demon was begging him, stop, where is stop, stop, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Ah! And I said, I'll give you about five seconds. What do you want to say? He said, wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. Let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. I said, you're coming out. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't. I said, oh, come on. Come on out of that in Jesus' name. And he started, he, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Come on, wait, uh, wait a minute. Well, anyway, he finally, I stopped and I said, what do you want? He said, I can't come out. I want to come out. He said, you've ruined everything. He said, since he came to the stupid church, we haven't had any fun anyway. He said, he won't do anything. He said, we can just torment him in his mind and his dreams. That's about all we can do. So he cries and prays all the time and prays that stupid tongue. And I just despise it. <laughs> so we tell him, shut up, shut up. We can't get any rest or anything else for him. He said, I want out, but I can't get out. I'm bound in here by a curse. Break the curse and I'll go. I thought, oh Lord, I can't let that demon know that I don't know how to break a curse. <laughs> So I sent a quick SOS. I looked very confident <laughs> as I sent an SOS to the Father. And instantly, you know, He never fails. Amen. And uh, just instantly, the verse came to me. Jesus Christ became a curse on the cross for this boy. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that were against Him. I declare the curse null and void and dissolved. And the de demon began to cry and cry and say, it's melting, it's melting, it's going away. And then he left with a horrible scream with a whole bunch of others. That young man's still in our church. He's a fine preacher of the Word of God. Married a sweet girl and they're really moving for the Lord. Thank God. You know where he got the curse? It was a love potion that had been put on him by his girlfriend when he was out in the world. Yes, and we have run across this thing over and over again. People who have been out in the world, especially in the drug scene, they have tangled up and people have dropped love potions on them. And it is a lust potion is what it amounts to. They call it a love potion, but it's not. Curses must be broken because they act as shields and fences around the demons. The demons will manifest. They will talk to you. They will battle with you and all of this, but they will not come out when they are bound by a curse. We must find where the curses are and destroy them. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> now in the book I have a list of a few of the curses and I'm going to mention some of the areas where curses are mentioned in the Bible. You'd be surprised how many are there. There are things that you can do. There are things that your ancestors and your forefathers can do to bring curses upon you. This curse will give a, le a toehold or a, a hole for the demons to work. Not too long ago, a friend of mine, Norman Parrish from Guatemala, came through and he, we were talking about some of these things and he said, don't forget when, along with curses, also destroy every legal hold and every legal ground that the demons have. Sometimes there's something that's not technically a curse, but it is a legal hold or a legal ground whereby the demon can operate. I said, how do you do that? He said, just, just declare it destroyed by the blood of Jesus. So when you're working on curses, do this. Now the wonderful thing about breaking curses is that once you become aware of this, you can take authority as a believer priest and destroy the curses on you, on your children, and on others. Now remember, too, some people operate like a revolving door. I mean, you know, you, you shoot the demon out this way and they just whirl around here to come in. They go out the front door and come, out, come in the back. And you can't do a whole lot when people are letting the demons back in, but you can pray for that person and loose the spirits of God on them to see what's happening so they can get their will in line where God can really minister to them and help them on a permanent basis. You say, well, how do I know that there's a curse? Well... If you're not sure, go ahead and break it anyway. Amen. I'd rather break a dozen curses that are not there than to miss one that is. Amen. It's not going to hurt, hurt anything to declare a legal ground for the enemy to be broken. If it's not there, it's not going to hurt anything. But if it's not broken, it can 
put a toehold for the demon to hang on to and stay put. And what we want to do is find out every way we can to get the people free. Now this is not something that... I'm not trying to get you all panicky and, and fearful because to me, deliverance is a, quite a bit of fun. You can get your recreation, your exercise, you can get a whole lot of things all wrapped into one in deliverance. Um, the, uh, I've gone flying across the church and uh, things of this sort. Uh, but you can, you can get a lot of... Uh, you, uh, the, God will refresh you in deliverance. One of the things that horrifies some people when they first come to our church is because our people seem to enjoy deliverance so much. I mean by that, they approach it eagerly. They don't say, Oh dear, here's another demon. Well, why should you be afraid of them? When the Holy Spirit's got them pinned, they say all kinds of stupid things, some of the funniest things you ever heard in your life. You'll hear in a deliverance session. Because when the, when the Holy Spirit's pounding away and the Scripture's got them addled and the believers are coming at them with the name of Jesus, they get so addled and so stupefied till they say all kinds of dumb things and stupid things and they make all kinds of mistakes. We had one here the, yesterday, I guess it was, and had him pinned up and, and I said, you better be careful, demon. You know, when demons get tired, they make mistakes. He said, I won't. But he did. I kept clobbering him and clobbering him and clobbering him. And finally he said something about... <clears throat> I said, uh-oh, you slipped, didn't you? He said, shut up, Whirly. I don't want to talk to you. I had one tell me one time, I don't want to talk to you, Whirly. When demons are talking, you get in trouble. And I got enough trouble already. <laughs> don't be afraid. Amen. We're not taught by the demons, neither are we instructed by them, but they know things that we need to know. They're like enemy soldiers who have been caught. And interrogation is in order. Now you're going to have to sift the information. You're going to have to ask the Father to run it through the screen and see what's happening. But I'll tell you one thing. If you just say, never, never under any circumstances will I believe anything that even says, you're wrong. They said, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. We know who you are. They can tell the truth. They don't like to. A lot of times I'll say, tell the truth. It'll be a new experience for you. Because they love to lie. Well, that one uh, yesterday, I think he was saying, I said, uh, you're lying, aren't you? He said, yep, nope. Well, curses must be broken. There's a song in this book called All the Curses Were Broken at Calvary. It's written by a young lady who came. And because we had learned to break curses, her life was set free. She's planning to go to Christ for the Nation's Bible Institute soon now. Um, the curses can be broken. Calvary has provided the way. We must learn where the areas are and set the people free. The devil has stolen a work on us because the people of God are in ignorance. They do not know. The reason we do not know is because we're not students of this book. Look how many people are in abysmal ignorance of the danger of the occult. I never, as a young Christian, heard a message mentioning the occult as being dangerous. <coughs> and you probably never either. And probably some of you never heard one unless you came to a deliverance meeting. You never heard any. Anything ever said about uh, the occult? When I was a college student, I got involved in hypnosis. Well, even before then, I was in India. And I got involved in hypnosis. I was good. I could put you to sleep when you didn't want to go to sleep. But you know, it did something funny to me, and I didn't like what was happening to me on the inside when that was happening. We used to do all kinds of real impressive things at college around the dormitory with hypnosis. And I never knew why I, I got to feeling so uneasy about it as a young preacher. And I finally just refused to touch it anymore. I just quit because it did something. There was something inside of me that went, or something that was lusting after power. And I didn't like it. It, didn't, it made me feel unclean. I didn't like it. I knew all the scientific explanations of why it was just perfectly, well, very simple, just pure suggestion. I knew all those little arguments, neat little things, you see. I got 40 hours of psychology behind me. It won't help you in this. The Bible will help you. But... Uh, at any rate, uh, it wasn't until we got into deliverance many years later and I picked up Angels of Light by Hobart Freeman that I knew why it was so bad. And I immediately renounced it, closed the door to Satan, and something lifted off of me that I've been carrying a long time. And every time I meet a spirit of hypnosis, they have a special hatred for me. You see, the demons recognize the people who've been delivered out of their particular brand of wickedness. Curses. 
Look at Judges 5. I want to show you one you probably never thought about. You may have loaded yourself up without even knowing it. Look at Judges chapter 5, verse 23 to start with. Curse ye Meraz, says the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. You know what he's saying? If you refuse to fight God's battles, if you become slothful and lazy and say, let somebody else do it, I believe you can bring a curse on yourself. I believe that God's people being where God wants them is not optional. I think it's necessary. I think there's a penalty attached if you don't. So I don't believe in such thing as that. Well, you can believe whatever you like. That's fine. I just believe it's dangerous to fool around and be lazy and not be what God wants you to be as a man or woman for God. I think we ought to be in our places, be ready to be counted. There's a scripture over in Jeremiah that talks about slackness having a curse on it. Jeremiah 48. We're going to be jumping around quite a bit. And I had to borrow a Bible, and that's like a woman borrowing somebody else's purse. It's hard to find anything in it. <laughs> Jeremiah 48.10 Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord. How? What's going to happen to these religious racketeers? You can mark it down. God's got their number. There's a curse attached to that sort of thing. And cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood? Doesn't sound like God's very pacifistic, does it? We're going to have to reevaluate a lot of things. You know, when I went to Bible, when I went to school, I was taught a lot of things about the Scriptures by godly men. I went to college, I went to seminary, I went to Dallas Seminary as well. And I wouldn't for one moment uh, say anything against any of those godly men who instructed me in the things of the Lord because they taught me some very precious things that I'll always remember and be thankful for. There are some things I learned they were mistaken about. For instance, they taught me, one thing they taught me was that the gifts had ceased. And I learned all the arguments. I tell people sometimes they come to the church you know, and they say, oh, have you read so and so? I believe if you'd read that it would get you straightened out. I said, as a matter of fact, I studied that in seminary and I probably know the arguments against what I'm doing better than you do. Just leave me alone. Because I found the reality of the Word of God, all of it. And I may not have all the handle on everything, but the parts I know, I really know, know. And I wouldn't go back to the way it was for anything in the world. Amen. Well, we need to find out from the Lord what these things say. You want a curse on you? Just do the work of the Lord deceitfully. You see how easy it is? That, now, a curse will give the demons ground to work. In some people, that may destroy them. In others, it may just be a hindrance. In others, it may be a mild annoyance. Demons do not affect people to the same degree, nor do they do the same things to the, the same demon will not do the same thing to people, the same person. Some people can be exposed to a lust spirit, and it'll be a mild annoyance, like a fly buzzing around. To another one, it'll be like a mosquito that bit them, and they have to take action. To another one, it'll absolutely just knock them flat. The same spirit operating. And all of us are not equally susceptible, but all of us are susceptible in different areas. And since you don't know what your area is, you better get your guard up in all of them. Amen? And also, about the time you see a brother or sister who's struggling and seemingly just falling flat every time they get hit with some area of their life, don't be too critical because... You have areas that are just that weak. And you may need somebody to have compassion and understanding and love for you when you go through your valley of trying to battle this thing through. There's some more curses. We're just going to run a few of them to let you get an idea of the, of the cross section. Look at Malachi 3.9. Malachi 3.9, you should be familiar with this. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. You say, how have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Did you know one of the reasons America is on the judgment train? She robbed God. Years ago, people decided that 10%, the majority of Christians I'm talking about, decided 10% was just an awful lot to pay God. They act like they think they're paying God, you know. It isn't really yours, you know. It belongs to God. You know how much Uncle Sam's whacking now? 20%. 
20% or better? I said, we can't afford 10%. Uncle Sam said, I don't care what you can afford. You're going to pay, pay, and pay. Our God has really shrunk up, hasn't he? You, make, you know, you, if you make the things of the world your God, God has a way of passing judgment. And I wanted to show you what's happened to our poor little dollar. <laughs> Against all the gods of Egypt have I executed judgment. We made this thing our God in America. And he... He's on, a, he's on a diet. He's getting smaller all the time. You and I need to realize that there's a curse attached when we're not honest with God in financial matters. Shoot straight with God. Now, if you've got this curse on you, you need to take it off. If you've robbed God, I would advise you to take action. You say, well, maybe I don't have it. Well, I wouldn't take any chances on it, would you? Isn't that silly to sit around and say, well, maybe I, I wonder if I do. Break the curse. If there is such a one, repent. That's what Brother Frank was talking about, people repenting of uh, the pierced ears and so forth and getting the things right with God. I tell you, we, we need to get as flexible as an old rag doll when God's dealing with us. Do you know that? Yes. Do you ever see an old rag doll? You know, you just flip the leg over this way and the arm over this way and it'll just stay there. Then you just turn it this way and that way. An old rag doll is just as flexible as can be. You and I need to be that flexible in the hand of God. If God said, child of mine, repent, go ahead and repent. Amen. And if you think there's an area you need repentance in, say, Lord, if I'm guilty in that thing, oh, here I come. Lord, I'm going to pour it out. I don't want to hang on to anything that you don't want. I don't walk in disobedience in any area of my life. So far as I know, I want everything clear. If you'll make it plain to me, I'll repent. You know what makes you not want to repent? Pride. Isn't that pitiful? Such needy creatures we are. And after all we know, and then we come up against and say, well, I don't think I have to repent of that. Isn't that pitiful? After all God's done for us, and we quibble over whether we should humble ourselves and say, Lord, I may have made another boo-boo. I may have been a fool again for a bunch of years. That's what it is. You see, the devil says, oh, you know, you don't want to be a fanatic like Frank Hammond's. And I may. You know how they are. You sure don't want to be like that wild-eyed worry. His bunch, they, they're demon chasers. See a demon behind every bush and one under every rock. That's not so. There may be a couple of dozen under there. <laughs> because the Church of Jesus Christ has the only remedy for demons and it hasn't been exercised on a broad scale for centuries. It hasn't been exercised to any degree at all. And the enemy has had things going his way. You say, well, Worley, it won't do any good. You sound like somebody else has been talking to me all these years. <laughs> they said, well, we'll get you anyway. I said, how are you going to stop the books? They're like, uh, they're like the feathers in a pillow, you know. Break that pillow open, you shake it open. You'll have a one time trying to gather up every one of those feathers. They'll go in every direction. Those books are in 20 foreign countries and all of the United States that we know about. It's, un it's unreal. Pigs in the parlor is racing across the country and around the world. Thank God. Hallelujah. Other books on deliverance. Praise the Lord. It gets people's attention focused on the enemy. And believe you me, he hates it. Amen. If you've been guilty of stinginess now, I would advise you to get it straightened out. And you say, well, you're not going to tell me how to do my money. All right. If you can live with your demons, they don't bother me. A lot of people, you know, come up to me and said, well, you're not going to cast anything out of me. I said, all right. I mean, I don't know what they expect me to do, get upset or something. There's two dozen other people just dying to get rid of theirs. Why should I be worried about one uh, stubborn cuss that wants to wear up and try to be smart? It doesn't bother me. By the way, when you're getting rid of demons, did you know it's not done cafeteria style? You don't pick and choose? When God gets ready, He may make a grand slam. I mean, He may go for the whole works. I know one time we were dealing with a lady and, and uh, the demons were just coming out so nice. We started on the ones she mentioned and it was just, you know, it was just kind of like uh, digging in a place that's full of potatoes or something. There's just so many. we just digging them out just by the handful. we just finding more and the Holy Spirit was giving us out. we just, we just reaching in and out they were coming. And everything was rolling just fine. And then somebody said, well, there's a, there's a nicotine spirit. And I said, all right, well, we'll go after a nicotine cigarette and addiction. You three, come on out. And the demon said, no, she wants me. I said, that's not true. This woman wants, she didn't want anything of the enemy in her. She told me so. Don't make any difference, Worley. I have a right to be here. She doesn't want to get rid of me. Well, I thought he was just being nasty, so I called his bluff. 
I said, all right, let me talk to the woman. So he backed off. She came up. I said, how about it, sis? You ready to get rid of those cigarettes? Well, I don't know. I said, okay, you're through. Next. She said, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm sorry, sister, you're through. That's far as we can go now. I said, you don't pick and choose with God. Amen. I said, God, we're getting you along right down the trail. But if you're going to call a halt and do cafeteria business and you're going to shop for what you want out, you just want the things that are annoying you. God wants things that are annoying Him too. Amen. And we quit. We went to the next person. Had a little girl in Houston in a meeting. She came up and people had been standing in line for three hours. And uh, Every worker I had was just as busy as could be. And we worked till past midnight every night. And, and this uh, young teenage girl came up to me and her boyfriend was with her and her, another girlfriend of hers and said she needed deliverance. I said, all right. So we went ahead and started delivering, started moving. And, and she got the giggles. Well, at first I thought it was a mocking spirit, you know, and so I didn't, didn't bother me too much. But then it turned out she was giggling. Her, her and her girlfriend just thought that was the funniest thing they ever saw. They were just giggling. So I tried about two or three times. I finally looked at her. I said, Sis, you're through. She did like this. I said, You think I'm down here playing, gal? You think I flew down here 1,100 miles to play games with you? I said, Move. You're through. And she, she went in a state of shock, you know. Because she did have some serious demons. But she thought we were playing games. I shoved her out of line. And there were 15 others lined up waiting. And I went to the next person. Brother Demon started coming out like crazy. And after about half an hour, her boyfriend still, she was over there just bawling, squalling around. He came over and he said, he said, Pastor, said, said, she's scared to go home. I said, that's too bad. He said, well, could you pray for her? I said, stand her in line. If she can get in before midnight. I said, we're shutting down at midnight. I said, i got to sleep sometime. I said, i get up and start in the morning at 10.30 and go all day and, and all night. And I said, that's about all I can do. He looked at the line. He said, I don't think she can get up there. I said, I don't either. I said, that's just too bad. Listen, don't play with this stuff. Amen. And I'll tell you something else. If you don't plan to walk with God, don't you get involved with deliverance. Amen. I mean, boy, you, you don't know what trouble is if you come down and play games with God and you get rid of a demon or two. If you get rid of 50 demons, you'll get 400 back. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus did. So don't play games with God. Mean business. But let's clean out the curses. The nest of curses on you, on your children. There are curses that are on every person in the Freemasons. An Eastern star. Have you noticed the Eastern star has got the points up like the goat's head, the Satan worshipers? Isn't that interesting? I've got a letter on my desk now from a lady who has a terrible problem in her home because her husband was in the Demolays when he was a boy. I tell you folks, the devil has got this thing going. You don't believe that the, Mas the Masonic Lodge is demonic. And my father is in the Masons. My wife's father is in the Masons. We broke curses on ourselves and on our children. We put a stop to that thing in our family. That's the best you can do. If you can't reason with somebody that's in it, at least don't let it continue past you. Put a stop to it. You may not be able to block something in somebody else's life if they're not willing to listen to the truth. But you can put a stop to it in your family and in your descendants. You can give them a clean inheritance. All the symbols of the Masonic Lodge come from the mystery religions. All the ceremonies come from the mystery religions. Every bit of it. You say, I never heard anything like that. Well, look at demolishing the host of hell, the demonic roots of Freemasonry. It's all in there, friends. The devil has been busy as all get out sewing this thing up. And when you wake up to how far down the line we are, it's liable to put you in a state of shock. And the only thing that will make you believe life's worth living is the hope of His coming and the power of His Holy Spirit that's going to come through the church to smash the enemy. There isn't any hope in this world system. She's gone. The whole world system is shot through and through with evil. But there's everything to hope for in Jesus Christ. And deep clean. For sure. And did you know something? You and I are going to get scrubbed too. We think we're doing pretty well until God gets a hold of us, don't we? We look pretty well in our own eyes. Well, don't get caught with stinginess. In Haggai 1.6, you might want to look at that one sometime. It talks about those who have holes in their money sack. You want to patch the holes in your money sack? Try breaking the curses of poverty, failure that may be over you and your family. And remember this. When you break family curses, go back at least ten generations. We have found witchcraft 
that had traveled through families for 1,500 years. The demons declared, and there was no reason for them to lie, that they had been in one particular family for 1,500 years. And I believe they were telling the truth. You talk about a family that was oppressed and in a mess, that's it. Now we know that the occult spirits can jump three and four generations. There's a curse to those who touch the occult to the third and fourth generation. So when we first got into this and we learned about this, then we began to break curses back to the seventh generation. Because we reasoned, well, you say, why'd you pick seven? I don't know. It was just beyond four. And we wanted to get far enough beyond four so they couldn't be any spark jumping. Because we knew the occult curses would travel for three and four generations through families. So we got to the seventh generation. And in the process, over the years, I noticed some demons would say, that's not far enough, preacher. I said, okay, 10, 12, 15, 25 generations. How do you like that? And they'd say, ooh, you don't do that. But I never pursued it. And then it was here, somebody walked up to me with the scripture, Deuteronomy 23.2, and said, Brother Worley, you need to go back further than seven generations. And I read the scripture where the bastard was cursed from the congregation of the righteous to the tenth generation. He said, I don't believe that applies to us. I believe it'd be wise to take, not take a chance on it. You know what happened in your family ten generations ago as regards the legitimacy of children? I doubt if anybody does. So when you're breaking curses, break them all the way back. By the way, curse breaking is not that difficult. It's not mystical. It's not. The one thing I like about deliverance, it's just forthright and flat facts. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, you don't have to learn a lot of cute little tricky things. You just learn the facts from the Word of God, the power and authority of the believer, and you let God fill you with His love so that you'll love the person that's being delivered, and no matter what they do to you, you'll love them, and, and your heart will melt and be broken because they're bound. A lot of people, you know I mean? They say, well, we used to do that, you know, but we found a better way. I know what's happened to them. The oil ran out of the crankcase. Love went out the window. And that car will run a little while longer, but it'll overheat. The oil is just like the love. And love keeps deliverance moving. you got to love. you got to have a lot of love to stay in there and work the long hours and the hard things. Take the hard knocks. Take the people that get their nose out of joint when they hear you coming. Whirly. <laughs> Hammonds. <laughs> you know. Yuck. They mess up our worship service. You know what I say? Any worship service deliverance can mess up needs to be messed. You'll have far more to worship God about after the demons are gone than you did before. Some of this stuff is sham. Now don't go away and say, well, he said all the worship is sham. I didn't say that, did I? I said some of it is. Deliverance never, never hurts any valid ministry that the Holy Spirit is working within a group of believers. It will undergird, strengthen, and deepen. It won't even replace what the Holy Spirit's doing. It will merely supplement and embellish it and enlarge it and enrich it to an amazing degree. If people are soul winners, let's take our, let's take our non-charismatic friends who think we're really nuts. Uh, you know, they're good Bible-believing people. The Baptists and the, some of the Presbyterians and Bible churches. And they're going out and knocking on doors and they're winning people to Christ. They've got a real soul winning program. Don't knock it. That's part of God's program. It's only part of it, but it's a good part. It's foundation. I'd rather they have foundation than nothing, wouldn't you? And they go out, and if they're soul winners, deliverance will make them better soul winners. If they're in the, if they're into healing, oh my, deliverance will just enlarge and magnify that all out of proportion. As a matter of fact, it's just hard for me to separate deliverance and healing a little bit. I know there probably is a dividing line, but it just runs across the line so many times. I see Brother Frank shaking his head back there. It's just hard to separate them, isn't it? They're just so, so interrelated. Worship and praise will be deepened and enriched, and you'll have a depth to your praise and worship that you will never have until you see the enemy running and fleeing before the name of Christ. I mean, you want, it won't be theoretical. It'll be actual. You'll see the enemy actually bite the dust. That's what the enemy hates so much. If I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, the kingdom of God is right here on plain display for everybody to see, believer and non-believer. Did you know something? We have found that unbelievers are not nearly as hard to convince about deliverance as Christians. I was in Nevada in a meeting in a, in a Baptist church, charismatic Southern Baptist church out there. and We were in a good meeting and 
there was a demon that was we'd been working with, and I got up and go get a drink or something, and there was a lady there, and her husband was a truck driver. He came in. He's a great, big, rough, tough fellow, and he was sitting back there, and <clears throat> I walked back, and I shook hands with him, met him, introduced myself, and told me who he was, and I said, did you ever see anything like this? He said, no. I said, well, why don't you come on down to the front where you can see, hear what's going on? Because when our workers are working, you can't hear what the workers are saying unless you're standing close. The demon makes an awful lot of racket, but we don't have to raise our voice. Why should we get upset? The demon's the ones in problem, having problems. And so he came on down, and we stood there nearby, and he was watching the demon manifest. He was really watching it. I said, um, by the way, sir, have you ever asked Jesus in your heart? He, he's, he's, he's looking at the demon down there, and he said, and I said, uh, have you thought about it? He said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, then I said, well, wouldn't you like to, would you like for me to explain to you from the scriptures what you need to do in order to accept the Lord? He said, yes, I would. I took him back. In a few minutes, that big old truck driver was in tears, and he asked Jesus Christ to come in his heart. The deliverance had broken and convicted him. I've seen this happen more than a few times. The awful manifestations of the demons that people say are so disruptive. I've seen it throw conviction into lost people over and over again. I've seen it convince men, great big strong men, that these things are real. And that they better get lined up with God because this is the other side of it here. Curses. We need to break them all. In Zechariah 5.3, there's one on stealing and squaring. Zechariah. Five, three. Then said he to me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. We better take heed. It does matter what comes out of your mouth. No wonder Jesus said, Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. What he meant was, Say what you mean and don't have to reinforce it by some kind of expletive. We've gotten familiar with that term lately, haven't we? Well, or bleep. In Proverbs 3.33, it says, There's a curse in the house of the wicked. I don't know all that implies, but uh, you might meditate on and ask the Lord just what that means to you. A curse in the house of the wicked. Now, here's an interesting one in Malachi 4.6. In Malachi 4.6, it says, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The implication is there's a curse implied because of improper family structure. The way to correct this is to turn the father's heart to the children, the children's heart to the father. Do you realize that in our country, because of the Jezebel spirit, working on both men and women, and the corresponding Ahab spirit, which makes men weak and spineless and spindly and, and makes the women wish they could kick them out of the house if they uh, could, because they won't take their place and they won't do anything. Did you realize that because of this, many of our boys have picked up feminine characteristics? We had a young man in our church recently who stood and testified about the deliverance he'd had. He'd been, he's been with us five, six years, I guess. One of our young preachers, happily married, and he said that just the week before, he had gone up and had received some more deliverance, and this had been in an area that had never been touched before. And what the workers had discerned were, were feminine spirits in this young man. Now, this young man was not feminine at all. Neither had he ever been involved in anything like that. But these spirits were feminine spirits, and it turned out these feminine spirits he had gotten when he was a child when he began to side with his mother against his father in the household. And as a result, when he grew up, he turned into the artistic field and became extremely artistic, extremely music-oriented. Now, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that, but his went to an extreme. As a matter of fact, his testimony is the, first, the last testimony in the first book, where he went to a hippie commune for five years. That's where he ended up. And he said that even on his job, he had noticed over the years, and then as he's a young married man, he had a distaste for things on the job that were masculine, like the heavy work and stuff. It wasn't that he couldn't do it. And it wasn't that he didn't do it, but inside he had a revulsion against it. And he said that week after he had been delivered, the difference on his job was unbelievable. That he attacked the jobs the men do on the, on the work where he was with a gusto and really enjoyed it. 
rather than having to push himself to do these things. Because you see that feminine spirit would think, ew, 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 pulling him back. There's a lot involved in the destruction of the family priesthood here. We've got to get our houses in spiritual order. I think as Brother Frank pointed out, our churches are only as strong as our families. In our church, we encourage a strong family. One of the things that the cults do is to split the families. And you can always find out that somebody's off in false doctrine when they begin to advocate well, husbands and wives split up, children split away from their parents. You know you're on the wrong track because God is the one who originated marriage. He put people together. He wanted them to stay together. He put homes together. He wants them to stay that way. The destruction of the family priesthood is a powerful, powerful spirit. And you'll find it in many children who've gone astray because the family priesthood is headed by Papa. And it's amazing how if you can get Papa in his rightful place, then a lot of other things begin to fall in place. Now, we men are all alike in some ways. We're not all as big as me and not all as little as Glenn, but there are a lot of ways that we're alike. For instance, we always think if our wives would change, then everything would be hunky-dory. Did you ever think that way? Now, some of you men are looking at me mean. <laughs> the ladies are looking interested. But did you know that it's amazing how, much, how easy it is for a woman to become what she ought to be when her husband moves into the place he's supposed to be. So when I go around in meetings, I spend a great deal of time working on these big, ugly men. Because God showed me a long time ago, these men and boys, the boys that are not married are going to be the heads of the houses and the leaders of the churches. And if they're not where they ought to be, then it's going to be hard for the wives and the daughters to be where they ought to be. They can make it, but it's going to be harder. If we can get the men where they belong. Anytime the church becomes an old hen party, it's because there's a bunch of old sick roosters around town. Because <laughs> God always intended for the men to shoulder the load and the responsibility and get it off of those women. It's not their responsibility. They need to be free to flow in the flow of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And they don't need to be saddled with a lot of decision-making and responsibilities that are strictly masculine. That old dump truck is built to haul a heavy load. You just throw a two-before two up there, and he just bounces around and rattles all over the place. He is a good heavy load. And then, boy, he can go down through there. As a matter of fact, he gets cantankerous if he doesn't have a load on him. You women don't believe that? Let your husband get laid off for a couple of weeks. He'll run you crazy. <laughs> Around the house, he can't find anything to do. He wants to do something. First day or two, it's nice, you know. I've been looking for this. Oh, I've been looking forward to this. Boy, about the third day, he comes out of his cave. <laughs> Because he's built to work. That's his nature. God built that into him. You say, boy, you're not talking about mine. Well, then something else gotten in yours. Then. <laughs> but God, God constructed men to carry the load and to shelter. And they have a protective instinct built into them. Unless it's been damaged and twisted by the enemy. Which is what we've seen. That's why there's a necessity for an Elijah to come through to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. And when the hearts of the fathers turn toward the children, what's going to happen to the kids? They're so thrilled because always they wanted daddy to notice them. Let me tell you something else while I'm chasing rabbits here. I saw one run across the trail. Let's shoot him. Uh, you fellows that have boys in your family, love them. I mean, take them in your arms and love them. Kiss them. Tell them you love them. You say, <gasps> yeah, I know. Maybe that's the way your dad did. He could not or would not show you love. In the meetings where I go, I spend a great deal of time breaking down the wall that men have built up around themselves. They didn't mean to. They didn't know they were doing it. But they're walled in and they can't even show love freely to their own wives like they want to. I'm not saying they don't show love. I'm just saying it can't flow freely because there's a barrier there. There's a need in every young fellow for masculine affection. It won't be met by mama and it won't be met by wife because it has nothing to do with sex, but it is a masculine thing and it's, it's the father or the father figure in that man's life. And I've gone around the country and usually when I grab hold of a young fellow, it's like hugging a chair the first time I get a hold of him. I mean, he goes just rigid. He thinks, what in the thunder is going on here? You know, that one back there is saying amen because he remembers the first time I got a hold of him. 
he came over to see about our church. He'd heard so many horrible things about it until he thought he ought to go see it at least once. Came over about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon look, so he could locate the building, and he thought, well, they must be having something special. The cars are all in the lot. We were. We were just having our normal everyday services practically all day on Sundays. But I'll tell you, you men have a responsibility. Get a hold of those boys. Love them. You see, if a father is affectionate at all, and there are daughters in the family, then the daughters, they get hugged, you know, and, and all this. Even when they're big girls, he'll take them and hug them and everything like that. By the way, dads, if you don't take your daughters in your arms and love them, they're going to wonder what it feels like to have a fellow's arms around them, and they're going to pick the wrong one. You better meet that need. That's your responsibility. Now, Mama can't take care of that. That's yours. And these boys, you think that they don't need anything like that, but they do. Because you see, a boy gets to us, uh, when he's little, you know, well, Daddy takes him and hugs him. Oh, yeah, Daddy's boy and all this and all that. And then he gets to a certain age and then it's, he gets patted on the shoulder. And he doesn't say anything because boys don't do that. Men don't hug. Now, who said that? God didn't say it. Why, how would you like to walk in on the Last Supper? John was laying up on Jesus' breast. You'd think, oh, we've walked into a, a nest of something. Laying around on couches, men laying on each other, hugging one another. Don't you see what the devil has done, friends? It's just another example, and there's no use in us sitting idly by and letting him take it away. And if you don't believe that God ordained the holy kiss, give the, greet the brethren with a holy kiss, next time you get a demon of rejection in, in deliverance, try reaching over and kissing him on the cheek and say, I love you. You better watch out. I've had them spit, bite, claw, jump, and everything else. Because those demons resent deeply the agape love of Jesus that can flow through believers. Amen. When we first got into this thing, people used to tell me, when you better turn those... We had all kids, practically. Nobody else had little enough sense to follow a wild ministry like that, you know. And uh, the kids coming off the street, out of the parks, everywhere. And friends of mine came to me and said, when you've got to stop those kids. You let those boys and girls hug each other. Don't you know? You're going to have the biggest mess on your hands you ever saw in your life. All those young people packed in there and they run around hugging one another and said, you're going to have an awful mess on your hands. And I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, what am I supposed to do? He said, son, you teach them the Word of God and teach them to love each other and I'll take care of everything else. Amen. And did you know something? We've never had an unpleasant thing happen. We've had a few kooks that came in there and said, oh boy, you get to hug old chicks around here, you know. They got one hug apiece. <laughs> Because those Hagwish girls, once the, that boy touched them, they said, uh-uh. And once that gal came in with the wrong thing, and some of the fellows came and said, I'm not hugging so-and-so anymore. I'm dodging her. I said, what's the matter? I said, well, there's something wrong with the way she hugs. There's a difference, friend. There's a difference. And if you are walking with the Lord, you can tell it. Now, we have love feasts break out in our place. We just have a ball. You need to get the family priesthood in order is what I'm talking about. And one of the things that will do it, friend... Papa, love that boy. Don't let him starve for love. Don't let him build up a wall trying to be hard and masculine. Whoever said that? Let me ask you gals. You think that, do you think uh, men ought to be masculine and not be tender? You think tenderness is a feminine quality, gals? You think gentleness is a feminine quality, ladies? But we men have been taught you got to be tough. you got to be hard. Macho. There's a macho spirit, by the way. There's also a Don Juan. But we've got to break down these old barriers and let the men develop into what God wants them to be. The family priesthood needs to be put in order. Destruction of the family first. He said, lest the, I smite the earth with a curse. And boy, if we haven't got one hitting us now, I don't know where, it, where it's coming from. People say, well, what do you think about gay liberation? I believe in it. I want every one of them liberated, and I know how to get them that way. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. Now, there's an interesting scripture in Deuteronomy 7, 26. We've got to wind this thing down. We've got fast clocks here in Arkansas, too. Deuteronomy 7, 26. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. Thou shalt utterly detest it, thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. This is what Brother Frank was talking about today. Did you listen? Here's your scripture. If you wondered if it was scriptural, what he's talking about, if you want one to hang your hat on, boy, I don't know how plain God can put it. 
You bring an accursed thing in, something that belongs to the devil, a sign of the zodiac. You bring your little Mexican sun gods and little uh, uh, Buddhas and all this mess. Those belong to the devil, friend, and he has a right for his demons to occupy those things. If you want some uh, documentary evidence, read for Our Demons for Real by Robert Peterson, a little paperback from Moody Press. Quite interesting, Missionary Borneo. You'll find out these things definitely have their facts. In Borneo, when somebody gets saved, they have uh, the people are so poor they don't have idols because they can't afford them, so they have pictures of the demons they worship and they paste them on the wall with wallpaper paste, with rice wallpaper paste. When a person gets saved, they go in, the Christians help them, the other Christians help them, and they go in, one thing they do, they, they scrape down the pictures off the walls that are of the demons, and then they even scrub all the paste off the walls, because they found if they don't even get the paste off the walls, there will still be sickness and trouble and affliction on the household. The devil doesn't need much of a toehold. And boy, we've thrown the doors wide open. I've been wondering about toadstools myself. Did you notice how popular toadstools have been getting? One of these days I'm going to look and see if I, I'm sure there's something about that. I don't know why. You know, anything gets that popular, there's usually something wrong with it. Did you know that? The old owls and frogs have inundated the land. A lot of other things. Don't bring an, accursed, an abomination into your house lest you be a cursed thing like it. God has cursed it and you will become under that same curse. How do you like that? Now, let me throw this out. I've mentioned this before, but there are some new ones here. Just for your benefit, let me quickly say, be careful about incense. A great deal of the incense in this country is made by devotees of Hare Krishna. It's manufactured, some of it in West Virginia, I think some in California. We had an experience of this several years ago. Had two teenage daughters at home at the time. They got sick. They were both in high school and they kept missing school because they were sick. We prayed for them at home. We prayed for them at church. Took them to church and prayed for them. And seemingly they just couldn't get well and stay well. We knew there was something wrong. We couldn't find what it was. One Sunday morning, I just mentioned in passing, I don't even know, the Lord just put it in the sermon. I just mentioned passing, be careful about incense. It could be dangerous. Some of it uh, might be used for wrong purpose. I don't even remember what I said. We got home. My older daughter didn't say anything, but she went upstairs. And she came back to the head of the stairs. And she said, Dad, look at this. I said, what is it? And she pitched it to me. It was a little package of incense. And she said, uh, I looked at it. On the front was a picture of the Hindu god, Hare Krishna. On the back was the Hare Krishna chant to get in touch with the infant. And then it said at the bottom, made by devotees of Hare Krishna in West Virginia. She had gone on a shopping tour with her girlfriend a couple of weeks before. And she liked incense. I don't know. It was vanilla or something. I don't know. Uh, and she just she never paid attention to it. She just picked it up in a little curio shop and bought it and brought it home. Stuck it in the drawer of her desk upstairs where the two girls were. It was in the room where the two girls were, where they slept. She pitched it to me. I took it and I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. You will foul spirits. Get out of my house now in Jesus' name. She let out a horrible shriek, just a little shriek, and she collapsed and sat straight down and fell into the lotus position. Her mother said, what's the matter? She said, I don't know. The girls got well. When we destroyed the incense. Don't bring an accursed thing in your house. Amen. Fred sitting back there, he came in from college one time. His testimony was in the first book. And he'd gotten, involved, he'd gotten away from the Lord. He couldn't read the Bible anymore. He couldn't pray in tongues anymore. He, got all, he just was all pressed and twisted out of shape in every direction. And I said, what have you been doing different than you did when you left for school? So, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I wanted to show you my karate outfit. I said, Fred, you didn't get involved in karate. Yeah, I got a green belt. Is that wrong? I said, oh, Fred, how did you ever miss? I thought you knew. Well, the upshot of it was he brought his karate gi over and we put it on my barbecue pit. Remember that, Fred? Green, it burned with a green fire. We had to put half a can of lighter fluid on it to make it burn. And it's just canvas, you know, just, just cloth. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to have to close down. But I want to refer you to Deuteronomy 7, which is where I plan to end up. Uh, 27, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 27. Read that whole chapter. You talk about a list of curses, but they're there. Everything from homosexuality to bestiality to incest, all of these things carry a curse from God. Remember, curses must be broken. But is it 28? No, I believe it's 27. It's 27. There's a whole list of them. Deuteronomy 27. I won't take time to go through them. You go through them and check them and check your list. 
Any you think you might have in your family or in yourself, break the curses. How do you break a curse? Let me give you a simple formula to do it. Well, let me give you the scripture first. The scriptures that God gave us, and I'm sure there are others. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. This just happens to work real well. It's broken every curse we ever run across. Galatians 3.13 and Colossians 2.14. Galatians 3.13 and Colossians 2.14. Now those are the scriptures I quoted earlier that God gave me when we ran across the curse for the first time. All you need to do to break a curse... If you say, say you have a curse of incest in your family, and that's very, more common than you would believe. If you think you have a curse of incest, for example, say, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I break the curse of incest in my, uh, on me and on my children, and if it's a family curse, I break it back to ten generations on both sides of the family. Get it on both sides, because sometimes it comes from both sides, sometimes it doesn't come from both one. But you may not know which one, so just to be sure, sweep the whole thing. On both sides of the family, back to ten generations, I declare the curse to be broken. Jesus became a curse on the cross for me. He died on the cross for me and became a curse, and he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that were against me. And therefore, I declare this curse to be null void. Now, you can try bunching the curses and breaking them all in a wad. We haven't had much success that way. The demons are very picky. They'll say, you didn't break mine. So I would advise you to take them item by item and break them. And then also declare all legal holes and legal grounds to be destroyed. Legal holes and legal grounds for the demons to operate. Declare those to be destroyed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh yes, that's a good one. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if I, yeah, as a matter of fact, we've even set it to music. We call it the curse breaker. It goes like this: Christ Jesus, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances against us, which was. Contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities, having spoiled powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Amen. That, that'll smash the devil's nest. Now that doesn't remove the demons. Remember, you don't cast a curse out, you break it. And if a demon has gained a foothold, then you work on him from that basis that he no longer has legal ground to stay there. Just like the occult opens up trails to let the demons come and go in your life and cause you trouble until you close the door to Satan on the things that you or somebody else has opened to you. Even so, these curses will act the same way. So you need to de destroy the curses, then the legal hold is gone. Okay? All right, let me see if I can remember all the areas. I don't even know if I can remember all the areas we've gone through. You know what might be helpful? I've got it all summed up here in a, in a word, right in this book. Let me see if I can get it here right quickly. The, there is so much bondage in our land today because of ignorance. So please don't arrive. Don't, you know, don't get to the place where, where you know it all because then you won't learn anything else. I find that every person who is really walking with the Lord, and is in deliverance at all. I can always learn valuable things from those people. I like to be around them. I like to hear them talk. I want to hear them speak. I want to read what they write because they've always learned something I need to know. And if you, if you learn a new thing to hang on the demon, praise the Lord. All right, Glenn, we'll just take them through this section of it, okay? We'll loose ourselves from a bunch of stuff. Brother Frank's already got you, and David has already taken you through the occult and forgiveness, so we'll skip over that. Let's go to domination, which is an area thing. Repeat after me, please, if you want to join in on this. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now renounce, break and loose myself from all demonic subjection to my mother, father, Grandparents, Grandparents or any other human beings, any other human beings living, or dead, living or dead that have ever in the past, the past are, are now dominating or controlling, are controlling me in any way contrary to the will of God. I thank you, Lord, for setting me free. I also repent 
and ask you to forgive me if I am or have dominated or controlled anyone the wrong way. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now renounce, break and loose myself and all my children from all psychic heredity, demonic holes, psychic powers, bondages, bonds of physical or mental illness, or curses upon me or my family line as a result of sins, transgressions, iniquities, occult or psychic involvements of myself, my parents, or any of my ancestors, of my spouse, any and all ex-spouses, and their parents, or any of their ancestors. I thank you, Lord, for setting me free. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now rebuke, break and loose myself, and all my children, from any and all, evil curses, charms, vexes, hexes, spells, jinxes, psychic powers, bewitchment, witchcraft or sorcery that have been put upon me or my family line from any person or persons or from any occult source or any psychic source and I command all connected and related spirits to leave me now. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. Let's go through one more here to finish it up. I come to you, Lord Jesus, as my deliverer. You know all my problems, all the things that bind, that torment, defile and harass me. I now refuse to accept anything from Satan. And I loose myself from every dark spirit, from every evil influence, from every satanic bondage, and from every spirit in me that is not a spirit of God. And I command all such spirits to leave me now. I confess that my body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. Redeemed. Cleansed. Sanctified. Justified by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, Satan has no place in me, no power over me, because of the blood of Jesus. Now take three or four slow, deep breaths and exhale hard and let them go. Come out of the people now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you spirits that have gained a foothold, Domination, control, psychic, the occult, move. The people have renounced you. You have no grounds to stay. I bind you to my authority in the third heaven in Christ Jesus, high above Satan, principalities, dominions, powers. Move. Loose the people and let them go. Just breathe them out, people. They'll come out. The curses are broken. They have to obey. They have to leave in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why don't we stand and sing a chorus of I'm free, 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 huh?
Feel a little freer now? Where's our instruments? You got one up there? That's the one right in the front. With this. That's the one. All right. Got it? I'll sing the verse. If you know it, you sing it along with me. Though the hosts of hell prevail and the demons come past me about and they tell me that God is against me, that he will not help me out. God in heaven will answer and save me and the armies of heaven will battle while the angels of darkness shall flee at the light of his majesty. Oh, the Lord is my light. Oh, shall I fear? Oh, the Lord is the strength of my life. Oh, who shall I be afraid? For I'm free, free, free. Yes, I'm free, free, free. Oh, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. by faith. Let's trust the Lord that he's going to break them out. They're not all going to throw you on the floor, you know. It doesn't matter how they leave as long as they go. Amen? For I'm free, free, free. Yes, I'm free, free, free. Oh, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. For Jesus has set me free. This is the end of this message.